Roger. Thank you. Roger, uh, there's a oh, shooting. Did you like box moving target? No, I took an auto track. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow, look at that. Look at that fly. Hi, I'm Howard with UFOs UAP Podcast 6, continuing coverage of the June 25th Pentagon UAP reveal. I have permission to hear a Q&A discussion with retired F-16 fighter pilot Chris Leto, who has expert knowledge of the video and radar systems in the F-18 jets flown by Commander Dave Fravor and Commander Alex Dietrich, who were featured on CBS 60 Minutes, May 16, 2021. In 2004, Dave and Alex engaged the Tic Tac UAP with visual contact with their two eyes off the coast of San Diego. Chris is discussing in great technical details the UAP radar videos officially unclassified in April 2020, but leaked in 2017 with two other videos. His guests in this Q&A are DJ San Marco, who is with UFO Twitter, UAP Task Force, and Nathan. They have a podcast that covers mainly UFOs called Life, MMA, and NBA. Though we don't have a new report from the Pentagon, this information and analysis is new. Let's listen in. I'm uh, Chris Lato. Welcome to the channel. This is a informal live stream, so my basic uh, first live stream uh, with uh, basically some uh, recent friends, DJ and Nathan. Uh, DJ, he is a uh, UAP uh, analyst, essentially, he retired from the Air Force back in uh, 2011, so 10 years ago, as a flight engineer. So he's used a lot of these systems. He has tons of hours uh, as well. So DJ uh, is is with us, uh, uh, as well as uh, Nathan. So Nathan, uh, I'll let them both introduce themselves here uh, here shortly. But uh, he also works on the podcast uh, with DJ. It's a uh, Life MMA and MBA is the name of their podcast. They've run uh, for several years now. Um, and so uh, Nathan, uh, he is very interested in all this UAP stuff and enters to really ask questions. The idea is they were interested in why is the Tic Tac uh, extraordinary. So a little over to you, uh, DJ. Tell us about uh, yourself and, and why you're here. Yes, sir. So, yes, this uh, this is a different iteration of many podcasts I've done. Most of my podcasts have been MMA focused. Uh, this year I started doing life MMA and NBA just so that I could cover a variety of different topics. I wanted to step away from uh, trying to popularize uh, the UFC because of uh, how they treat their fighters. Uh, Nathan and I just started uh, doing some stuff together in the last month or so because I had him on with Andy of uh, uh, That UFO Podcast, and Nathan was so brilliant that uh, uh, in analyzing uh, the UAP phenomenon that I just wanted to do more stuff with him. And once you hear him, you'll understand why. Uh, but yeah, former Air Force flight engineer, about uh, just under 4,000 hours of flying. Um, on which uh, most... aircraft? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Okay. okay. Um, you know, I started off in the C-130H like a lot of guys. Uh, you fly what we call slicks uh, before you go into AFSOC. And then uh, if you get yourself selected going to AFSOC, uh, I flew the Combat Talon II. Most of my time was on that. And then I did my last three years. Um, Combat Talon II is like a low-level infill exfil airdrop resupply. Special forces. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, there's some really impressive background on these these pilots and we're going to hear more details so now we're going to hear from nathan um an average american just coming into this topic in the in recent years like a lot of folks who follow this really interested to learn more get your perspective uh, and ask some questions that i think um are on a lot of people's minds uh, about you know where where we go from here if in fact these things are doing what they are uh, purported to be doing DJ, uh, we were talking a little bit before we started here, um, but your point is basically, your argument is that there's so many witnesses, especially for the Nimitz encounters. If you look at the Nimitz encounter, and I just started looking really deeply into the evidence and listening to all of the, uh, the witness accounts, um, and you look, there's just 
just so many people that actually just looked at these with their eyes, you know, with binoculars on the Nimitz. You know, you have almost, what, 5,000 people or something in a carrier group. And these things were following them, supposedly, in 2004, following the Nimitz to where you could just go up and use the big eye, which is this big camera system right on the front. And, and Gary Voorhees was saying that, that he would just go look at the big eye and then ended up just using his binocular. It's true. Hundreds of people on the Navy ship saw these objects with their eyes. You know, that's what you do in any, like, crash safety investigation uh, is you make sure that every single possible explanation is ruled out. Um, you know, but, but for this purpose of this really is just what, what if we can just assume for the purpose of this conversation uh, that the Tic Tac is, is legitimate, so all of the claims that were made were correct. Um, you know, what does that tell us about uh, why it's extraordinary? Uh, and, you know, and basically, if there's any questions about the FLIR system, so I have it set up here. I have, like, my Xbox uh, set up so we can talk through, basically, uh, you know, this, this energy circle at the beginning just, just blows me away. You know, Mick West brought that up, and I was like, man, you're right. Like, because before I thought it was tail on, you know, so, so basically some, some points, but really kind of just focusing on the Tic Tac, uh, why it's extraordinary, um, and, and basically answering your question, so an informal uh, kind of question answer session. So that's the idea for this podcast. And Nathan has a series of questions that he wants to ask from a lay, lay person standpoint, and that's going to add a lot of value because, like you said, a lot of people, you know, the Army calls them NVDs, you know, night vision devices. We call them NVGs, night vision goggles. I mean, so, you know, we got to, you know, be careful with our terminology, but the most, you know, to me, like to step through it chronologically, Kevin Day tracking these on radar for several days, I believe seven nights, seven days prior to saying to the saying to his leadership, I think we ought to engage, uh, send the skipper Fravor and his wingman to engage this and see what it is, vi visually observe it. Now that's really amazing information. They've been tracking these UAPs for seven days before they sent the F-18s out to track them. That's just amazing information. These things are real. They've been seeing them for seven straight days. I think even longer. Seven days. The Navy is, is amazing in their electronic attack um, capabilities. You know, I worked with, uh, I did electronic attack in the aggressors up in Alaska, and we were using these, these electronic attack pods. And you can hear they're talking technical about how those radar electronics work and how detailed they are and how they can zoom in on, on the target they're looking for. And it's, you know, they know something. I mean, the navies know something that we don't know. But I hope we can find out some uh, future Pentagon report. And the best ones we could get were the Durfum technology jammers, you know, digital radio frequency memory. It's really digital jammers. And they came from the Navy, you know, the the. the the software we were using, the codes, uh, uh, even the, a lot of the hardware well, was from the Navy. So the Navy, I think, is just kind of ahead in a lot of ways. In, in certain ways, uh, you know, I think all the other services have their big advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but you bring up a great point. This, this SPY-1 radar uh, that they just put in, that was a huge upgrade. And from my understanding, you know, again, limited, is that it can see very high up. You know, if you're looking at high missiles, so if you're trying to detect inbound incoming missiles, you're trying to defend certain Middle Eastern countries <laughs> or whatever. Uh, so they look up, actually. That SPY system is is looking up. So that's why I can see these things coming down from like 8,000 feet, et cetera. Uh, or more. They, yeah. I, I don't yeah. know that they want to tell us how high, but they say he said 80,000 feet at least. If you look at like an air traffic control radar that would spin 360 degrees, little blips would appear on the screen and it was up to the ability of the radar operator to look at that uh that on his screen and figure out okay that's an aircraft that's traveling at this speed there's rage rings and there was a lot of interpretation from the radar operator now we're taking those returns we're sending them through signal processing units and there's a lot of computerization that's going on with those radar returns that come back that we didn't have that goes on on the aircraft when, we, when we're going to talk about jamming later on, um, those signal processors interpreted that they were being jammed. I just want to comment on that. They say that they've been jammed. The UFOs are jamming the radar of these F-18 ships, 
and they detected that. But they haven't gone into any detail. But you can hear from uh, what, what they're saying that they are getting a lot of uh, data for, on their equipment. Hundreds or thousands of things that it's interpreting to uh, that they then the operators going to look at and put their uh, uh, you know for them to look at and interpret and give feedback to command. Did they receive jamming? I guess from the Alex ship has, received jamming of their ship. Yeah. I don't think so. That's that's the interesting question. So that I, that's almost like your first big question. Okay. Did this object not determine that phased array? Either it didn't a interpret it to be a threat, or b did not have the ability to jam it one or the other, because the 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 energy that's being put out by a spy one is not a focused beam of high RF energy that will literally uh, make you feel warm inside. If you're tracking something, the best is passive, right? So passively tracking something, obviously they don't know that you're that you see them. Um, but with, with radar, it, that's the whole point is you have to send energy that, that is being sent back. So they can pick up, they can detect that energy. And when you send the energy, uh, actually, so the way electromagnetic radiation travels is that it's, it's, it's by the square root of the distance, right? So basically, if you have a flashlight and you, and you bring the light up to it, you won't see uh, against a wall, you won't see any light, won't see any light, and then all of a sudden you'll see the light on the wall. You'll see the circle on the wall. You know, that that's because the energy is dispersed. It decreases by the square of the distance, uh, however that works. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the point is you have to send a lot more energy one way than back. So it's easy to detect that you're being targeted because they have to send double the energy that their rate, well, much more magnitudes of order more than the energy uh, than the radar needs to detect. You can do a lot of things with ASA and yeah, it'd be interesting to know. I'm sure they that's have the uh, first anomaly. Systems. Yep. That's the first anomaly is why didn't it, if it could jam a phased array radar, why didn't it? it? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Well, the first thing is, what do we, what do we know from that? Assuming, yeah, again, again, assuming it's all legit, right? So we're assuming that it's completely, uh, everything's taken at face value. Uh, it can pick up these things, right? That was kind of interesting to me because if you look in a lot of the FLIR videos, if you look in, none of them have any any range, um, or I, I believe none of them show any true range to the target that's based off of uh, energy coming back, um, right? Because basically you, you have to send that energy pulse out uh, and it has to be coded because it's military systems, right? I mean, you have to, people have to remember that these systems that we're using, they're all designed with, with the requirements that they can be anti-spoofed, you know, anti-jammed. Um, so each pulse that it sends out is specifically coded. Also, you, just, you don't want to get confused with other random random codes out there. Uh, but so each little each little pulse is specifically coded. So when it comes back, it can say, "Yeah, this is my pulse." And it, it took this long to go that far, so I know how far away it is. Right? That's how the radar pulses it. Um, but what's what's happening is, for some reason, the ASA, the, the big system on the ship, right, which has these tiny little, which can can send out these little pulses that are hard to detect that can pick them up you know or maybe it's the processing in there uh, but when you look at like uh, the radar although um, chad underwood did say he, he picked it up on radar as soon as it seems like it's getting a lot of energy on it it, it just drops it um mm -hmm. and uh, and a lot of people have been saying that's it, it's due to jamming um it it i guess it could be there's nothing saying that it that it isn't you know the responses from the radar is that it's being jammed um the signal processor thinks it's being jammed exactly uh, it, it, what it's all you all we know for sure 100 percent, is that it, it has been modified you know from outside of whatever parameters the radar is expecting so that that's an interesting result to me um is that it, it has been modified so it's getting pulses back so it's reflecting mm -hmm. So it's reflecting off this. So if you go, I think I saw one question, you know, like the, the pulse bubble or what is it, you know, if it's in like uh, some a plasma bubble, mm -hmm. I don't, that would be an interesting question to actually ask is what happens if you throw radar, uh, you know, a pulse, a pulse train, you know, cause it's a bunch of pulses mm -hmm. in a row. Uh, if you throw a pulse train at a plasma, what bounces back, you know, is, is it? Uh, yeah, the, the, and the plasma argument, I mean, it's just so many different uh, hurdles that they would have to leap over in order to be a 
a plasma bubble because now we'd have to look at where was it projected from. We're in a we're in a, a circle here that was somewhat concentric. So would would Fravor have flown through their projection? So there's I, I've kind of dismissed the the plasma bubble argument. I think this is this is a, an object of of a substance that that the radar on the that they were able to track and actually make a shape out of it and say, okay, that's a shape, and that shape looks very similar to the Vizop. As you can hear, they think they've really detected an object, and uh, the radar is detecting it, and they have very sophisticated equipment that they've seen the shape, and it's, it's not plasma, it's not lightning or something like that. This is more information that we've gotten from the UAP report. They're analyzing the, the gimbal or the, or the go fast or the flare videos, and they know they're real objects from the equipment because they know how the equipment works. And so this is very exciting information. So you're saying they were able to shape, like basically shape it from the radar returns? No, you or, saw it. I mean, you, uh, you saw it. Oh, I'm sorry, the flare. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah you, what you're seeing on the FLIR jibes with the Vizob. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I don't know what it looked like on radar. We may never know that. Yeah, I do want to show it later because I've seen a couple arguments saying there's confusion between the TV and the IR mode. You know, in the TV mode, that's we can talk through uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more of that. But let's just uh, finish with the with the radars. So and and basic jamming. So we know the ship saw a bunch of these, right? So it sounds like there was there was many of them. Uh, and then we know that Chad Underwood was able to lock it, lock at least at least get a vector. So sometimes what you'll have on your radar is it'll 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 hit it'll give you a hit saying that it's receiving some energy there but then you command a lock on on that point and i want to say that visop i think means that they saw it visually with their eyes besides seeing it on the radar and their other equipment uh it's very exciting e2 is very capable radar as well and in a different radar band uh than your spy one radar mm -hmm. um again and all we're tracking yeah. it Yep. Also yep. seeing the object and and had those tapes pulled. You heard the maintenance guy, the avionics maintenance guy who put those bricks from the E2 in the safe and an Air Force officer walked in and he said he knows that because of the patches. That's a crazy story, right? The and, men in and, black story. This is And a, someone with yeah. civilian clothes with yeah. that person so and they in said a black suit. Case. Like to be so just so classic. I, there there's been a lot that's come out my eyes in the I would say the last 7 days or so. My eyes have been very opened about some of the dif disinformation programs. Well, what they're talking about is the uh, Pentagon is try was trying to block the information. They didn't want to release the high-res radar tapes and like the sci-fi movie, The Men in Black. They don't want the public to know what's really happening. So they come in, they take out the tape, and it's gone, and nobody can talk about it. One thing I wanted to point out that I, I put in our chat earlier is that, so you wonder why with all this automation and this literally multi, multi, multi-million dollar Spy One radar, what do you need Kevin Day for? And the reason that you need Kevin Day, and when you hear him talk, and he'll talk about that, is the reason that he went to Top Gun school is not because the radar does everything automatically. The reason he went to Top Gun school and graduated is because he has seen thousands of tracks. So he can look at something and know what he's seeing and know the capabilities correctly of what he's seeing. And that's the value of a radar operator on a system. Radar operators know what they're seeing and they're seeing real objects. And these guys are just verifying that. But by the time that uh, they send Fravor and Dietrich out to, to this object, there's been a ton of observation, a ton of uh, electromagnetic energy that has been uh, directed in the field of operation. Uh, there, there's been a laundry list of things that the professionals have gone through to assess whatever this or these things might be. And they've confirmed that it is something there. There is something there. It's not just sort of a weird uh, glitch in, in the technology. It's it's not a, an anomaly. There's something that needs to be investigated further. So Fravor and team are sent to Vector on this target. When they get there, 
uh, this is what what interests me. Uh, when they arrive at this location, uh, Fravor talks about the observation, uh, looking down below to the to the sea level, and seeing the churn in the water and seeing the erratic motion of this object. Um, as a pilot who you know flies a lot out in open water, and, and the things that you're used to seeing. Um, I, how how did his account strike you, Chris, in terms of what uh, what would have, would have been going through your mind if you had seen an object behaving in the way that he described? Yeah, I mean that that was the video that that changed my whole you know perspective was that interview with with Fravor and Lex Friedman, you know, because he because um yeah I've, I've tried uh, I guess to ex uh, explain before that after a while you know you just get so used to it you know like a uh, like you, DJ, you know, you've done so thousands and thousands of hours, you know, if somebody w was explaining to you about a MC 130, you know, this type of, of mission that you did all the time and was explaining as you walk through, you know, here's the FLIR, I'm looking at this, this uh, system and I see this, um, at least for me, after so many years, it, it felt like I was there. Um, you know, it's, it's as close as I can get to saying I'm, I saw something, you know, I haven't seen anything, um, that I, that was not, I couldn't, my brain didn't, didn't make sense of <laughs> at least, you know, physical movements. I've seen a lot of things my brain doesn't make sense of, uh, in the world, <laughs> but as far as, yeah, as far as that, um, yeah, it really threw me off that, uh, uh, what, what would I do? It, and that's funny, right? That's the whole point of training is so when you get into a situation you haven't been to, you know, like whatever, uh, getting shot at or something, um, that you, you will do what you practiced. Um, and so in, in that case, uh, I think for him was just, uh, try and get closer to it. You know, I'm sure he thought, can I, can I get any video of this somehow, but he didn't have a pod, you know, he has no pod to try and video it. But I think the biggest thing is what is that thing? You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the you, you talk about the inertial yep. movements, you know, when it's just moving, when he describes it as uh, it, not moving like a helicopter. You know, if you look at a normal helicopter, it, it, it has to change its lift vector and then get back into, and it has to actually over rotate. Mm -hmm. Okay. The same thing, you know, here, okay. the rotor mast has to, has to lean in that direction. Yeah. To just, counter just, the inertial. It's just a plain, plain stuff. Yeah. Woo! Like, yeah. Any, any, <laughs> here's a MiG 29 broken and then, uh, whatever my one model that made it, um, well, like say you're out of formation, right? You're this, you're this plane and you're out of formation. You have to put in an acceleration, right? So you have to change the throttle. You have to push it forward faster than you need, essentially, right? To stay level. Like, let me see. Yep, got I want to, I want to be level with this guy say, right? So I want to catch up. I have to push, I have to put more throttle in. I have to make one correction, right? And then in order to stop, if I, if I don't change it, I'm going to keep accelerating, right? I'm going to keep accelerating. So you have to you have to put in less power than you need to slow down, and then fix it. You have to make three corrections. Does that make sense? I have to I have to push the throttle forward to accelerate. Mm -hmm. So the the plane I'll start moving forward, right? But then I'm going too fast. I have to actually go back further than I need, so that I slow my momentum, and then I have to push it forward to make it the correct thrust that I need. Does that does that make sense? Yes. So you, you need three fixes to change your your uh, your lift vector uh, essentially that, at least from my experience okay i'm sure this physics guys they're going to yeah can i I, huh? I just want to yeah. ad lib one thing just to give and it's not trying to butter up uh, you or the fighter pilot community but i'm from the afsoc community the mc130 ac130 community i have asked people about this uh, i've talked to the cv22 community the mc and ac130 community uh, and I'm sure if I were to be able to talk with the 160th, they would say something similar. You guys are the best in the world when it comes to identifying something in the air and evaluating its capabilities, full stop. Yeah, we, I mean, none of us. Yeah. <laughs> I can have thousands of flight hours in an MC or an AC-130, but it doesn't mean that I know, understand aerial engagement. So if somebody is a lay person that's never done this, you don't know how far away you are from their level of knowledge when it comes to looking at something in the air, identifying it, and evaluating what its capabilities are and how freakish they may be or may not be. 
And they, uh, they're, what they're talking about is that these pilots, these fighter pilots, know what they're doing, know what they're seeing. And again, they saw a real object. It wasn't swamp gas or bald lightning or whatever. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question about that too, though. So if, if, they, if they're coming into this, uh, to this area where the object is, is moving, if the object weren't bouncing around the way they described it, and if there wasn't the churn in the ocean that, that was described, let's say it was a stationary tic-tac approximately 40 feet long, close to the surface of the water. Yeah. Is this something that... <laughs> it's bizarre. That, it's bizarre, but is this something that would have right. caught the eye of, of a pilot? Like, would he have, no, could he have flown right by it? Yeah. When you look at um, how they actually locked onto the GoFast video, that, that's the point. So the argument that, that they're making, right, that it's a bird uh, or it's a balloon or something... Uh, is that it's just it's essentially stationary okay i mean it's it, unless a bird anything going th less than 50 knots to us is essentially kind of stationary um our radars can't really see it it's very difficult for our radars to see it helicopters are very difficult to actually see and engage just because they're so slow you know all the just the way our systems work uh is your your radar is going to pick up movement so it, your radars pick up movement as well uh, basically velocity change. On, so the Doppler shift on that, on that, uh, pulse train, right. But your, your eyes work exactly the same way. Um, and this is why when we're fighting, right. If I do, an, if, if I'm trying to intercept you, right. And say you're flying in your plane, you know, like this, right. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, as I do my intercept around, I'm not going to be here and just fly around like this. So you can just see me on the horizon. You know, I'm basically going to go low or high and I'm going to point, you point right at you. So as I'm making this intercept to your, to your rear, see, as I'm intercept, when I'm going to your tail, you can't, you can't see me because the move, because I'm point on. Right. Because you're not seeing this rapid movement. You're not seeing a, a plane form and line of sight. You see less. And, and you and you want I don't want a fast movement on the horizon, you know. So, in, environmentals make they make a huge difference. Uh, they make a huge difference. You know, the sun, where the sun's coming from, uh, how the clouds decks are laid, the the moisture in the air, how how far you can see. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Day, they they know all this stuff. You know, when they do their check-ins, the last, what's the weather, and then you give this weather briefing. Um, yeah. So to see, and that was a big thing for me on this is it's just a it's just a clear day. They say it's just this. It's just a clear day. There's water is there's beautiful. nothing out there. It's like you're walking. You know, you're just walking to the coffee shop, and right across the way you <laughs> see like this. You know, this flying thing going like this and just moving around. Whoa. You know, and there's nobody else around. You know, I mean, that's basically the same analogy. I would, I would say. Is, yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Let, let let's talk yeah. about what does it take for an object to do that. So Nathan alluded to there's something under the surface that they have described as. Um, a fuselage looking object under the water that's making the water boil um, or at least disturbing the water. And so these guys have seen probably by this time hundreds uh, of submarines that have come to the surface and it wasn't that. So it's something else. And they see this object buzzing around, but it's moving in an erratic way. Yes. What does it take? for something to do that so we have an object an aerial object i'm not going to call it a flying object for reasons we can get into later but what does it take to do that chris to yeah, propulse I mean, something like that it has zero inertia i mean it, you're basically it has zero momentum you know so that's why in order to you know a helicopter has to put our lift back in you know we put our lift vector this mm -hmm. way will turn but then if you want to go the other direction or stop your direction you have to actually accelerate back to level you know, that's why, you know, we accelerate to something and then we have to decelerate uh, when something moves. You know, it gets faster to here and then it slows down, slows down, stops, and then it gets faster and slows down, slows down. So your, ex your acceleration vectors are, are constantly changing. Um, and with this, there's no, <laughs> there's no inertia. It's like it's, it's, it's like it's light or something. It's, you know, it doesn't adhere to our, uh, to our actual, our laws of physics. You know, right, the way that we interact with something in the air. So it's like a so laser get... pointer. Yeah, if you if you flick a laser pointer around, that's kind of how it, it reminds me of it right. actually moving around. And so we we get we get to that point, 
And now uh, Dave Fravor has been vectored onto it, and he looks down and he sees it. And at some point, he tells his wingman, Alex Dietrich, "I'm going. You stay high. I'll go low." And he points his nose down. At which point, now the object, according to Dave, points the oblong nose of of the tic tac at him. So you, as a fighter pilot, are thinking, "What when that happens?" Yeah, this is probably the biggest difference for me on the on the Nimitz and the Fravor engagement um, because and that's what you're always wondering so you know if I'm like if I'm fighting with someone you can tell you can tell immediately if they can't see you right there's this it's this old adage lose sight lose fight you know as soon as I merge as soon as I'm I can if you merge with someone to fight them you know and by merge normally is you know we haven't you haven't been able to identify or shoot each other prior to this point and then you pass high speed and now you're you're trying to get your weapons on first, right? So you know you've you've engaged with a with an enemy, um, and so now you're trying to get uh, uh, your your weapons on uh, as as fast as possible. Um, so it's it's basically from this engagement, I can tell exactly. Uh, well, normally is when they don't see you, they just they're kind of continuing. You're like, where's he pointing? You know, like where <laughs> where mm -hmm. is he going? Does he know I'm coming to shoot him? You know, and mm -hmm. and usually it's because they don't know, because uh, it's just so hard to keep track of these planes. Well, we're getting a lot of information about how the planes go after their their targets, and Dave Fravor was up there with uh, Alex Dietrich, and uh, they saw it with their eyes. Like the same thing I was trying to say with the with the go fast, is it's it's you can barely see a fighter at four nautical miles. You know it is bare. You can barely see a fighter at four nautical miles. And if I'm pointing at you like I just showed you, you're not going to see me at four nautical miles. <laughs> like it's just, you know, we talk about this. It, yeah, if I'm pointed like this, you're going to see me. You know, to see a to see a bird flying at four nautical miles, like halfway between you and the ground, is is it's just impossible. It's like okay, but we can for, we can talk all the semantics about focal length and depth of field or whatever, but you know, basically for them to get the lock in the go fast video, they had their sensor on the ground, you know, on the water, essentially because they saw it with their eye. You know, they put their little sensor box. You know what I'm talking about? You know, they put mm -hmm. their little sensor box out in front of it, looking outside through through your helmet, and then waiting for the little white ball to fly into there. And then you look down, there it is, and now they take the lock. Um, ah, that was that was a sweet moment. <laughs> well, you can you can do that if you see it, right? If you see it, because it's a mm -hmm. white ball traveling right over the white paper. Black you know, water. The blue water. It's bright mm -hmm. blue water. And if you see this little white ball, you see that movement, it, it, you pick it up. You know, you you will see a little white speck moving across the sky on a blue background. Easily. You need contrast. You got to have contrast. Yeah, but if it's up at thirteen thousand feet, it's halfway between you and the horizon. It's it's already uh, four nautical miles anyway to see a bird with your eyes. And it's not moving. I mean, it's just it's just not possible. So I mean, and they actually saw it. Then they locked onto it. But let me go. Let me go back to my question. Yep. Your Fravor, you nose over and you see the object turn, and and face you. What are you That's thinking at that time? This is this is the first engagement where it, it it's maneuvering in relation to them, and that is where this is where we can you can talk about why it's extraordinary. For me, that's this is why it's extraordinary. You know, because they look at the Omaha, uh, you look at those other events, and we hear that hey, these balls they were maneuvering in relation, they were following the ships, uh, you know, it's tracking right along. Um, but it's not exactly, it's not as obvious, at least for me as a pilot, when that thing points at you, it's, it's like someone, if a plane, if I can see the plane, like move, like if he points his lift vector, a lift vector is, you know, where you're, where, if I pull, that's where I'm going to turn, mm -hmm. you know, I can, if he points it like this, you know, you can tell he's like, he's, he's, he's looking at me, you know, it, mm -hmm. it feels like, it feels like a, he's, the plane's looking at me, you know? Um, and so that's what I would have felt, man, is like... <laughs> I've just been engaged. That's what I was thinking when Fravor said that. Uh, and then it started yeah. coming up co-altitude with him. Yeah, so he's talking about a, a, a two-circle fight. I have my pe mm -hmm. some pens here. Um, so basically, you. you have the little tic-tac uh, over the water. So he's he's searching this little patch of water down here, okay? And they said it was like the size of a 737 under the water. Mm -hmm. And then you had your Fravor... I'll put him in green up here. He's with his two ship, right? 
Uh, so they arrive there at 25k. Um, and so Dietrich, she just holds above, right? She's holding up here. And, and basically, the holding pattern you're going to use is one where you can you can turn and see, you know, see the ground. So basically, three to four miles, just right overhead in, in a constant turn. So, she, you know, she's going to stay within, uh, you know, I would say this is like uh, two to three nautical miles. If you can read that. So this is uh -huh. probably two to three nautical miles, uh, radius of a circle. And then you're looking at like four miles high, you know. Um, so that just gives you an idea. Uh, uh, of that so so basically she's going to stay up in this holding pattern with slate right uh commander slate this is amazing information how the two planes are tracking the tic tac slate was the back seater for fravor i believe but i'm not i'm not positive yeah so he's your experienced you know he's your super experienced wizzo he's i from my understanding it sounds like he's running this engagement you know um at least from the from the back he's the experienced you know uh, uh Dietrich, from what I understand, was was new. She's brand new. I think this guy, this kind of situation, oh, okay. he's going to be so, running the show. And that, and really, I think you know, Dietrich's probably just trying to get, gain SA and, and keep in the right formation. So as she descends, you know, as Fravor descends down here, um, he's going to be basically in that in that same kind of over the ground turn, but down at this altitude, at a lower altitude, right? So he's he's descending down. If we look at above now. So let's say this is the center. So basically, they're they're orbiting this thing, right? You can see that. Mm -hmm. So Fravor, he, he's going to pitch his nose in and descend. Okay, so these are descend descend lines, and Dietrich's just going to stay up here watching him as he starts descending down, right? And and he's he's going to fly a, just a lower circle around this thing. Uh, and so what happens is, as he starts descending down, it basically turns, and it starts descending up. This is above, remember? Now we're looking from above. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is like, uh, this is basically in a normal fight, when we're fighting, I kind of mentioned it a little bit, you're trying to, you're trying to tur turn faster than the other guy, you're trying to raid around the circle uh, faster. Um, but this thing is climbing, actually. So he's climbing back up, and that's what also was was amazing to me is is when this thing is, sorry, when this thing is climbing back up, uh, it just climbs from a from a from a standstill. You know, if you look at any any air shows like F 22s they have to have airspeed, some airspeed, 100 knot, you know, maybe 50 knots, but then they still it's a slow, you know, climbing out. Absolutely. This maneuver right here, where it, it turns at them, it turns at Fravor, and then it, it, it maneuvers against him, uh, is just is crazy. That's that's a mind-boggling kind of maneuver there, where it, it just comes up, and it's in relation to him. So you know it's, I mean, from everything I heard, it, it knows. It's, it's flying in relation to him. So uh, Okay. Uh, that's amazing. So next Fravor moment is they're now in a circle where, as you said, uh, Fravor might be slightly above the object because he leveled off when he saw it come up. Yep. Um, and because obviously he's going to level off when he sees it uh, it gaining altitude, he's going to say, oh, okay, well, it's coming up. So yes. now you have a guy who has no webs aboard, no rounds of ammunition, and he decides to, I think they have a 40 millimeter on there, but they had no ammunition, and they decide he decides to cut across the circle yeah. and aim his his aircraft at this thing so now we have yeah. one of two things that, that could happen first of all a class a could happen because he could have actually hit it and secondly what strikes me as a non-fighter pilot aviator is the bravery it takes to do that yeah i mean <laughs> i don't think he thought about it uh let me draw this I mean, Just this is a guy who this, D Dave Fravor is the type of guy that when they took his tapes and they brought it to another, I think they brought it to the CIC and he went up there and said, what'd you do with my tapes from that mission? And he said, oh, we've got him. He goes, you got 30 seconds to give me those, say those tapes. I'm going to start tearing this place apart. Like that's, that's the type of dude that Fravor is. Exactly. I mean, you don't get to the position, like I said, you don't, you don't get to that position by 
uh, not being the man, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it happens, but it, everything I see is he's the guy exactly like I would expect. You know, that's the guy we want uh, <laughs> yeah. being in that position. Uh, and he's not going to not do it, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, so, so basically here I just continued. Um, so what happens after a while is while they continue turning, remember we're looking from above. So Fravor, he's in, he's the green line. They turn if we're looking, and and so what you end up with is they're about a mile across. Uh, okay, from above, and this is a normal kind of fight. This is a neutral fight, we would call it, because we're both neutral. Um, but what he's able to do is when we when you say cut across the circle, we do this to try and point your uh, your guns. Is it, this guy continues his normal turn. Um, then this guy, he, he's going to over-rotate, right? Over-rotate and descend. So that's where you're going to do like a diving maneuver. And, and at some point in here, it just like vectors off, right? So he's trying to affect a rejoin. He's trying to get closer to it. And it just, I still don't get it actually. It says it just disappears, but I don't know what's going on. If no, well, you got to listen. He was on Fighter Pilot Podcast. Um, he's been on a number of shows, but I've also heard him say it It didn't like, quote, disappear, but it moved so quickly that it looked it like appeared it disappeared. To disappear. Yeah, it just moved at such a rapid pace. But here we have a craft that if you listen to Kevin Day, that where it went from, he tracked it going from 28,000 feet to 50 feet in under one second. Amazing, amazing information. Well, that was quite a discussion with Chris Lato and DJ San Marco. Uh, amazing. Both pilots experienced in the equipment, and they were mainly analyzing Dave Fravor's interaction with the Tic Tac. To me, I'm convinced that it was a real object, and that both of them are convinced that it was a real object and they were analyzing the angles of attack and and how it approached and how the object pointed at uh, Dave Fravor's F-18 and started up towards him like it was intelligently controlled, which it likely was, and amazing. This was a, about a 41-minute podcast out of almost two-hour Q&A from Chris, DJ, and Nathan. I'd also like to thank Chris Lato for allowing me to use his podcast in my podcast and on my YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to Chris Lato's channel. And also thanks to DJ and Nathan. The podcast is called Life, MMA, and NBA. There should be more to come, but if you like this blog, please subscribe. I'm at anchor.fm slash Howard hyphen Barenbon or crazy tech on youtube so please subscribe and the subscribe button on youtube is up on the right side of the screen and thanks for stopping by